Good morning, everyone. My name is Jason Wright. I am the director of the Leadership Management and Governance Project, LMG Project at Management Sciences for Health, MSH. And we're very happy this morning to be bringing this session to you to talk about capacity building. I wanted to give you a little bit of background about the LMG Project uh, before we got into the session itself. Uh, again, it's the Leadership Management and Governance Project. It's based in the USAID Office of Population and Reproductive Health, and we're very happy to have Rena Shukla here, who's our AOR. For those of you who are students and don't know that acronym, which many people, until you work in the government, have no idea what it means. It's the Agreement Officer's Representative, or in uh, common terms, the Project Manager, as opposed to myself as the Project Director, uh, based at MSH. We do the work at LMG based on our belief that inspired leadership, sound management, and transparent governance will lead to improved health results. And we base that upon three basic principles, on country ownership, on gender equity, and on evidence-based approaches. And what we wanted to try to do today was to extrapolate a little bit from that and talk more generally about capacity building and how capacity building actually helps to achieve those results in the first place. And when we want in, in particular to explore the dynamics among donors, implementers, and recipients, as well as evaluators and, and, and how that capacity is built and how the results are achieved. What we're hoping in the context of this session, both through the panel, uh, a few surprise guests that we'll have from the audience, as well as uh, uh, audience participation as well, that we'll have an entertaining uh, session today, both for those of you here in the room and, and the folks online as well. So I want to hand it over to my colleague, Carol Douglas, who's uh, offered to serve as a facilitator today, and I'm looking forward to a great session. Thank you. Hi, I'm sort of allergic to platforms, so I'm just going to wander around here. And we wanted to get a sense, can you hear me okay? Great. We wanted to get a sense of our participants here um, because we're, it's all about capacity development, which encompasses kind of a broad range of ideas, which we'll hear about from our experts. But in the meantime, would you please stand up if you've ever um, been in an organization that has delivered or provided capacity development? In, in, if you're older like me, it might have been called something else, like capacity building or training or whatever. Wow. Wow, we have a lot of providers, wonderful. Thank you. You can sit down for the moment. <laughs> um, and would you please get uh, stand up then if you have ever been in or are in now an organization that has received capacity development assistance in any way? No. I mean, to a large extent, we all have. We've all been in school and so forth. Terrific, thank you. Two, wow, all right. Well, I would ask you, we're gonna see if this works. I think we have enough room. If you would please come to this side of the room. And I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. Um, we're going to, this is going to be a measurement, a survey measurement. Going from here, this is zero at this end, and that's extremely at that end, okay? So if everyone, everyone would please come over to this wall could ask you a couple of really easy questions. You don't even have to say anything. Oh, yeah. Oh, usually it's like, usually it's, oh, okay, okay. Okay, terrific, okay. So on, so on a scale of, Hi, um, again, on a scale of from not at all to extremely, how useful do you think that your, your um, capacity development has been if you've done it? Zero, extremely. Well, there is movement. <laughs> it looks like everyone's mo sort of moving down. Feel free to push chairs out of the way. So we have a spectrum. We have a spectrum. 
Okay. People who have received capacity development on a scale of not at all to extremely, how useful did you find it? <laughs> right smack in the middle, okay. And one more thing, um, do, you, do you mean to be spread out, like the whole spectrum? No? Where do you, um, there wasn't enough space. Okay, so you think it was very useful. The people who have received it are consciously, raise your hand please. Okay, are also sort of in the spectrum. And one last thing, do you um, raise your hand if you think that you, the provider, and you, the receiver, um, when you were providing, that you were on the same wavelength with your recipients? And sort of, kind of, yes, sort of, kind of. And do you think that they are still using what you provided? Yes? Extreme, yes? Kind of, sort of? Okay. Thank you very much. You can have a seat. And if you are um, a little bit bold, please, when you sit down, come on further to the front. That would be great. Thank you. So clearly there's a spectrum. Um, I'd like to introduce our panel members who represent a spectrum of organizations as well. Um, Rina Shukla has been introduced. She, rep she is from USAID. We have Barbara Tobin, the Senior Technical Director for the Center for Leadership and Management at MSH. And Anupa Deshpande, who is a Senior M&E Monitoring and Evaluation M&E Advisor for the Center for Leadership and Management at MSH. Um, and, you know, Jason Wright, who is the head of leadership management and government, governance at MSH. So, uh, would you please, starting in any order that you would like, I, yeah, I think Rena's starting. They're each going to speak for a couple of minutes about their experiences with capacity development, um, what's worked, what hasn't, what are some of the things to think about as we go forward. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to kind of share some of the donor perspective on uh, capacity development over the years. I think that um, USAID in particular favors the opportunity to work with local organizations because it's vital to promoting country ownership and locally uh, generated responses, which will ultimately lead to sustainability. So uh, we are really excited to work with local partners. Um, one of the main things with capacity building interventions is that it's generally seen as an impor important component to achieve a larger development impact, such as supporting local organizations in the health sector to improve uh, maternal and child health outcomes or access to antiretroviral therapy, for instance. So it's seen as kind of an important component um, to achieve a broader development goal. Um, one of the main things that donors look for in particular is having capac tailored capacity building plans that have clear metrics and really a demonstration of how capacity building leads to promoting these larger development outcomes. Um, the idea is that the interventions have clear benchmarks and um, plans to show progress over time. One of the main considerations we also think about, in addition to how this promotes larger development outcomes, is uh, sustainability. So how do these types of interventions over time uh, promote sustainability? And um, looking at kind of graduation-related indicators within capacity building plans. And in addition to that, uh, we also, obviously, one of the main challenges that um, we come across as risk uh, management and compliance related issues, which can be a challenge uh, for some local organizations. So it's a contention we often have to balance between um, wanting to partner more with local organizations because of its importance in development versus uh, 
you know, challenges with uh, the organizational systems, um, particularly related to financial management, that often tends to be a concern for um, for USAID. So, that's some initial thoughts. Good morning. Can you hear me? Is my mic on? How about now? Okay. My name is Barbara Tobin. I have been with MSH and working in organizational capacity building, organizational development, capacity strengthening, whatever you want to call it, for quite a long time, including about eight years in the field in Kenya. And in fact, I just got back last night, and it's still warm and sunny there. <laughs> <laughs> just thought I'd let you know. Um, as an implementer of technical assistance in capacity building, I have found one of the most useful skills to have is juggling. Because what I do sitting in the middle is listening to our donor requirements and compliance, listening to our organizational uh, capacities, our technical expertise, what, what we have committed ourselves to doing in the field, and our client organizations to make sure that what we are offering actually responds to the needs that they have. Uh, as Rena mentioned and as one of the themes of this session, often those three are not the same. You know, what we need to do to be compliant with our donor uh, often requires results in a very short period of time, for example. Uh, our organization may have technical capacities that we would like to see in many places in the world. And first and foremost, the organizations that we work with as clients need to feel that what we are doing is responding to the needs that they have. Uh, and they may vary, and you can't have them necessarily all happening at the same time, but it's like having plates spinning. You have to make sure that you are really having all of those working in partnership, and especially recognizing that the needs of your local client organization, you, they need to understand them. You need to have an absolute shared understanding. You need to understand what your intended outcomes are from the very beginning so you don't lead each other astray. Uh, if you can get everybody working in harmony, you can, you know, together you can do wonderful things. And otherwise, it's challenges all along the way. And, each, you know, we have some ideas of how to do that that we can talk about later. Uh, but there's no virgin territory. There is no place that hasn't already had some capacity building. And there are multiple capacity development out organizations out there, each one showing up at these local organizations separately. Each one saying, what you really need is to work with us and come to our workshop. And the answer is always yes, thank you. But what does that look like back at these local organizations who are trying to deliver services and being out at training workshops a whole lot of the time? So I think we have some inherent challenges that we can think about together to make sure that what we're doing is effective. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, despite the two-hour delay. It's nice to see so many people here. My name is Anupa Deshpande. I work in monitoring and evaluation at MSH. And I just want to offer a couple of introductory remarks from an evaluator or an m and &E perspective on uh, what, hello? Okay. <laughs> what, uh, on what the experience is and what the challenges are from, again, the m and &E perspective. Um, m and &E is intended to reflect the intervention itself. So. Um, myself and my colleagues, I'm sure, and Emily work with a lot of the challenges that Barbara just um, summarized with developing a capacity building intervention, if you will, taking into account some of the intended outcomes such as sustainability, country ownership, things that take a longer time to demonstrate, but then also looking at the process of capacity development, the process, the processes within which um, this intervention is, is intended to um, to improve, so starting out by saying this intervention is designed to, in, to improve the capacity of what, to do what, and then building on that plan um, is something that, that m and &E folks work and struggle with implementing folks um, and, and program designers. Um, certainly not a perfect science, there's a bit of an art and a science to m &E, as we know, um, but it is a bit of a, a, of a, of a challenge to 
to clearly communicate and, and arguably manage expectations from the donor side, the implementer side, and the receiving organization side about what, um, what capacity building means and what the promises are therein. So I just offer a couple of these introductory thoughts uh, for the discussion. Look forward to it. Thanks. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank the panel for the wonderful discussion about capacity building. I noticed that we have a donor, an implementer, an evaluator. Having worked with the CSO for over 25 years, I would like to ask the panelists, where is the CSO? Where are the voices of the CSOs? because they are the recipients of this capacity, so-called capacity building exercise. In my experience, what I have found is that when donors come or implementers come to provide capacity building, it usually comes in a form, in a package where it isolates one activity, like for financial controls or for leadership or for management or for evaluation. So it doesn't provide the kind of capacity that looks at the systemic view of the NGO or the CSO. Secondly, capacity building sometimes comes in the form of training somebody. A favorite example of mine is training doctors to perform IUDs. After they're trained, they leave. And a lot of times also when capacity building is suggested to the CSO, it's not about capacity building, it's about resources. So when it fails, the CSO is blamed for the failure of that capacity building exercise. Again, I would also like to say that as a CSO, we have multiple donors. Each donor comes with their own prescriptive res re uh, solution for the problems we have in capacity building. So in order to capacitate us, they have various exercises that we have to go through, that we have to take off work from, and this does not lend itself to providing us the capacity that we need. I suggest that donors collaborate with each other to come to us with a comprehensive plan that allows us to know what our needs are. When I say that the CSO is not represented in this panel, I feel that it's very important that we listen to the CSO. They understand their needs. They understand the requirements that they have. They work within the environment of the government. They have responsibilities to their government. They have responsibilities to their donors. There's a lot of filling out of forms. So basically what happens is that the CSO is left to flounder. And for the last 20 years, everybody has been doing capacity building. So we may want to ask the question, well, where is the capacity? Why are we still building capacity? Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll go back to our panelists and then open it up to the audience. Where, um, why are we still building capacity? What is that all about? And secondly, uh, respond to any of her questions, but particularly that one, if you would. And also, um, how do we get how do we get the CSO at the table and not just in the corner filling out forms? <laughs> Thank you. Anybody? Who wants to start? Well, I can, um, well, well, first off, thank you very much for those important observations. That's very helpful for us, um, I think, both from a donor and implementer perspective, that often we, uh, we don't take, we don't include the CSOs that are, uh, you know, ultimately responsible um, for driving the country response. So thanks for all of your important observations. To your point about um, civil society participation, I think we uh, all need to do a better job of ensuring that um, we consult often and uh, with local civil society organizations and make spaces, uh, like, uh, ensure that we have uh, we create seats at the table in the same way so that those perspectives are being incorporated because that's a very important um, I, I think often when we're rushing to get programs going we can overlook that just because of timing because of lots of other 
I would even say administrative hurdles. So those are important things that we need to guarantee. Um, so thank you for that. In terms of um, harmonization, that's also an important point. And I think that in some countries now, um, I'm not sure you know it can uh, be a challenge to get it moving uh, in the right way, but um, we are working towards um, organizing joint audits with other donors to reduce the strain on local civil society organizations with all of the different compliance requirements. And also um, look to harmonize capacity building approaches, so perhaps um, allowing uh, some donors uh, to focus on organizational capacity building for a particular organization and um, USAID would focus on other aspects of capacity building or even focus on other civil society actors in that country. Um, I mean, that could be an, a way to reduce the strain on local organizations. But. Thanks very much. Those are really clearly crucial points to think about when we're doing capacity development. So let me tell you a couple of things that, that we're doing in our projects to really try to address those. Um, it's absolutely true that when an organization goes in to help build a capacity in one particular system, the spotlight goes on that system, whether it's financial management or whatever it is, to the detriment of everything else. And unless you're building the capacity of the entire organization, it doesn't do you much good to have a fabulous one system. Because one, everything else suffers, and two, the minute that assistance leaves, what stays behind? So we start with really both a comprehensive and participatory management assessment of all the different systems with the CSO itself really telling us what the status is now. Um, I am a firm believer that you need to put your client in the driver's seat. I think the era of being a recipient or us coming in and blasting you with our good ideas of what you should do, I think those days are over, and if they aren't, they ought to be, uh, especially with the multiple TA programs. I find that oftentimes an NGO won't tell you what else they're doing because one, it's embarrassing, two, they aren't going to say, no, I'm already working on this with somebody else. Where is your workshop? Oh, that's a nice hotel. I'll, I'll, I'll go to yours as well, even if it's duplicative. And I think that the idea of having a comprehensive capacity building plan by an organization where, where they are in the driver's seat saying, this is our plan, what's your TA gonna do? We don't need that this year because we're working on that one and that's what we need to prioritize. So thank you, we don't wanna turn you down, but you know, kind of flipping the roles here so it becomes much more demand driven. I, personally, I think that's absolutely the way to go in the future. Um, in the present, not even in the future. One of the ways we have done this with a project in Kenya, with a project called Fanikisha, is USAID asked us to work with four to eight national level CSOs to enable them to provide capacity building for their, their uh, local affiliates. The previous project had worked directly with 162 local CSOs. Can you imagine? Uh, and realize that really doesn't work very well. What they need to do is capacitate, I don't know if that's an American word, but capacitate local NGOs to be able to play the role of, of capacity building. It shouldn't be something owned by us, that we come in, we're the ones that know how to provide this TA, and they sit there at the other end saying thank you. So what we put in our proposal, and at first MSH croaked when we said this, is we can't tell you what organizations we're going to work with. We are going to use a selection process where we will put out an EOI. And if there is a national level NGO who wants to work with us in this capacity, they can apply. Uh, and the ones that pass the management uh, uh, assessment, so we know they are strong enough to absorb this much money and that they can do this, we'll select from there. And the reason this was so, and actually USAID agreed to it, and we went in, we held a meeting. So if you were all the NGOs, whoever would like to work with our project on a capacity building initiative in which then you will work with your local affiliates, here's what you need to give us. Tell us why you want to do this. Tell us how you have already built your own capacity. What are your priorities now? What works the best for you? From the, I don't know, 300 who showed up then, we whittled it down to, to the four to eight through this competitive process, and they loved it. We put them in the driver's seat. We help them learn how to not just 
receive grant money, but how to actually give their own grants. The documentation you need for your donor, and to make them more the owner of the whole process. And the last thing I know, I'm talking a long time, is that one-off trainings are absolutely useless. Save your money, save the U.S. taxpayer money. If you don't make it a process, it's not going to stick. You bring somebody in for a three-day workshop and then say, okay, go back, do well. Really? But if they're learning, if they're applying it on the job, if they're coming back, if there's coaching in between, if you help them understand how training individuals connects to improving systems, how you make sure that it becomes part of what their work is, then you get somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions following that up? Things that resonate with you, don't resonate with you for our, ex our panels? Something you're curious about? What, uh, Maybe to get the discussion going a little bit, it might be a good idea to uh, get into the dynamics a little bit more that I talked about and, and just some sub questions for the various panelists. Something that I know from having worked at USAID for a number of years is the fact that donors are not monoliths either. Even within an individual donor, there are certain uh, pushes and pulls that go on all the time. And in our non-parliamentary system, obviously, there's a relationship between Congress and the executive <laughs> branch that goes on that oftentimes makes things rather interesting in terms of how you're implementing programs. You get the appropriations, you get the authorizations, and then within those parameters, you have to try to create the most uh, productive uh, process. And then also, to be honest with you, in the implementers as well, the structures of different implementing organizations are quite different in terms of what the balance is between headquarters and field. And it might be good to, to, to share a few thoughts, uh, Rena and Barbara, in terms of how those dynamics impact on, on how you're able to implement programs. Jason, I'm glad you brought up the point about fact that donors are also um, contending with lots of different priorities and um, directives that change pretty frequently. So um, I think that that plays a big impact on capacity building because um, often we are under a lot of pressure to demonstrate results on, particularly in the health sector, on achieving, um, you know, reaching a certain amount of people, getting a certain amount of coverage uh, to impact uh, public health uh, in a broad way within a country. And those challenges, or the, let's say those kinds of priorities that we need to demonstrate rather quickly to ensure funding and support from Congress uh, can play, can damper capacity building interventions because uh, capacity building, as Barbara mentioned, takes time. Um, it's a kind of a participatory process that involves a lot in terms of both technical and organizational processes and getting buy-in. And we are often under, you know, yearly, uh, on a yearly basis, we need to show results and concrete numbers that show the number of people that are reached, uh, number of health facilities that are strengthened, number of people that are trained. So that can often contend with uh, longer term capacity building interventions. conversation for, for one second. I just want to make a plug from an evaluator's perspective. We talk about capacity building results and the indicators that um, are prescribed to us by donors um, and that we also uh, develop as part of our, um, as part of the intervention that we're designing. Uh, but I just want to make a plug um, nodding to some of the factors that we've talked about here, meeting the CSO demand, um, looking at capacity development as a participatory process, uh, looking at uh, the organization's plans to follow up on the capacity development interventions that we've provided, and, and making a plug for a qualitative component to complement the, the numeric quantitative results reporting that we do that then could be shared with not only the donor but with, other, with the CSO themselves to be able to try, contribute a little bit to try and look at this um, in a more uh, comprehensive way as, a, as an ongoing process. Um, and then, you know, I think the broader question is how much is enough? And I'm not proposing that any of us know the answer to that, but it is something to have perhaps an open discussion with uh, CSOs that have been working with donors for uh, a number of years to just sort, kind of put that elephant into, into view in the room. Thanks. 
I just would like to add, um, that's a great point, Anupa, about including uh, more of the qualitative dimensions around capacity building. That within USA, there is a group, um, it's called the Local Solutions Group, um, and it's kind of building on looking at capacity building broadly and how can we work together to look at kind of more of a systems thinking approach and develop other types of indices um, to measure, to better capture a capacity building and how those, how building capacity um, are important enablers as well to achieving um, longer term development outcomes in different sectors. So it is something that we recognize and are trying, we're trying to pull from, but it can be difficult to tell the story because it, there are so many complex components of it. Yeah. That's great news, I hope we captured that in the video because <laughs> one of the big challenges in the kind of work we do is how do you measure it? And how do you make the link directly to health results and outcomes? Because it's not a direct link. You know, We're not actually out there giving immunizations and we're not out there specifically doing it. But without the stuff that we do in leadership and management systems, they can never get out there to do that work so efficiently. So, so drawing those connections has been something that's been challenging for years. And, and, and understanding the connection is, is hugely important. Uh, all the leadership programs we do kind of have the same principles that I mentioned before. It's over time, so you learn something in your leadership program, you go back out and you try it in your work site and then come back, and it's all related to specific health indicators. So it's not just learning leadership skills for their own sake, but each they actually train in teams rather than individuals because one of the challenges in every health system that I've ever worked in is people get transferred. So they go through your wonderful training program, they really know what they're doing, they're all excited, and whoosh, you know, they're transferred partly because they now have this new set of skills. So the very things that you train them for enable them to, few, to further their own careers but doesn't do their actual facility any good. So we train in teams and the challenges that each team take on are directly related to a health area. And increasingly in geographic areas, we will work with whether it's the county, the district, or the provincial health team for them to identify the area in which they would like us to work. So if, it's, if there is a particular malaria challenge or child mortality or whatever it is, so then every team that works, that, that goes to our training works on that indicator, then we can show some progress and actually link it more directly to something as, as kind of amorphous as leadership. Um, because otherwise, this is a challenge <laughs> that's, that's hugely important and hard right. to measure. Yeah, I, and that's where we have to deal with the M&E people all the time who are right. telling us, is, yeah. Right, because we ask what are, how closely linked is your intervention to health outcomes? Is it more proximally linked, perhaps like providing, um, you know, uh, d distributing or giving uh, immunizations? I don't work in immunizations, <laughs> or I haven't yet. Or is it a bit more distal, perhaps like some of these management yeah. skills, governance skills? What does that look like? And be able to look clearly at what um, what we expect to come out of these interventions. That's often a conversation that we have from the M&E perspective, integrating M&E into, into program design. And then begging to ask for a systematic and systemic view at how delivering inter immunizations will affect health outcomes. What are the other factors that complicate or, or contribute to that happening? From the lights being on to people, migrant populations being home, whatever it is, I'm sort of pulling out of the air, but having a bit of a comprehensive plan. I know it's difficult to do with the time restraints that we sometimes have, and reality is not theory, um, but it's something that I think programmers and, and evaluators struggle with continually. I, I wonder if maybe someone in the audience has some experience designing uh, capacity development interventions with some of these factors and have had really good or some really challenging experiences to share, um, either from an M&E perspective, a donor perspective, or an implementer perspective. There were several people that lined up against that wall on a spectrum. <laughs> you all lined up against that wall. <laughs> and a lot of people on the far end, so, and even on this, on the closer end. So I'd really, if you, to the extent you feel comfortable, love to hear some experiences. Yeah, so there's a mic here in the center aisle, or Carol could also come by you, how, whatever is easiest. Um, hi, my name is Angela Onime. Um, um, I've been listening to um, what we've been, you've been saying, and um, uh, in building capacity for CSOs, one of the issues you have is that it's your problem, 
that you've seen, not their problem. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the things we you have to deal with, and which is a question is, how do you make it theirs, not yours? Because you can come and tell someone, this is the problem you have. That's okay, you feel, oh, you have a big blimp on your face. While the person feels that, you know what? The major problem I have is my toenails. It's basically two different things. So you are talking about something else and the other person is talking about something else. So there's a systemic issue. There's, there's no communication. But because you are on the donor you're, and, and you have USID on you, so you're like, OK, no, this is the problem. And suddenly they're like, OK, particularly in the developing countries, they're like, okay, I don't want to offend you, so fine, this is my problem. Get, let's solve this problem. But the person is still feeling, I think my toenail is my problem. Right. Mm -hmm. And you've not right. addressed this problem, you've addressed what you've identified. And so you see, so what do you do about such issues? How do you integrate, like you said, what are the systemic issues, the root causes? Because maybe his toenail, the facial blimp, everything else, there's something, there's a root cause at the bottom, which might be a governance or a leadership issue. And then putting it up with numbers. How many people want to see number, number of people, something has happened, number of people, this has happened. But like you said, if there's bad governance or if there's bad leadership, those numbers are not going to work out. Or those numbers might be there, but it might not be qualitative. Mm -hmm. And so what do you want to achieve, the quantity or the quality? Mm -hmm. And then what, what do you want, the short-term effect of I've done what I'm supposed to do, or the long-term impact of 20 years coming back and knowing that this person can stand on his own as, like, I can do things on my own. I, can, I don't need MSH. I don't need MSH to go to USAID or to go to the World Bank or to go to UNICEF to access funding. And I can also be able to also access local funding. So those are some systemic issues. How do you go about it, looking at it so that you, we stop, they stop seeing it like somebody is coming to give them a solution. And they are looking for, we need answers. These are, they can clearly state their problems and also find out the root causes of their problems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, we could take a couple more. Yeah. yeah, do you want to take a couple more and then we'll? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay, and, we'll I, I see. and others may have responses or contributions. Yeah. This is anarchy. <laughs> with, with us on a raised platform. We don't have to do it like this. <laughs> Hi, my name is Leslie Heyer, and my company is Cycle Technologies. Um, we work in reproductive health, and we are a private company. And I'm just wondering if any of you can speak to the role of the private sector in capacity development, if there is a role, and what you see it as. Would you just like to speak to that? I mean, you're probably more knowledgeable than we are. Well, no. I mean, I think I, I'd like to hear your perspective um, because we do think that there is a role for us, uh, but we don't necessarily always get a seat at the table either. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's potentially something we, we, we might have some value in. I think the issue of when is capacity developed and then what happens at that point is another place where it seems like the private sector should be involved mm -hmm. in that you're probably handing off and now you're hoping this is a robust market, et cetera. So I guess I'd like to hear your perspectives further on it. Yeah. Are we gonna have some more? I had a quick, sorry. I'm Kate, I am with USAID. I was in the, um, the global health field out in the field for about 15 years and I'm only recently in the, uh, the agency now, so I have a little bit of both perspectives, but would just kind of uh, speak to all of us in this community practice so that there, there does need to be more space. I think we focus on what happens in the field and a project and measuring it and all of that, but I think if you go up the chain, you'll find that there's restrictions as you go up. The ME officer has to measure what's in the contract. The contract has to measure what was reflected in the ADS, the, you know, and it kind of goes back up. So I think there are groups like the local solutions and others within the agency, but I think the voices need to be raised that we need some space. Um, I've implemented USAID agency um, global health programs and there's never the time or funding to go out and do the consultations and speak with everyone else and what are the other donors doing and what do you guys need and let's have a local learning agenda. There's just not that space. I think it's more of instead of looking at the end of the problem but kind of raising voices back up the chain that the mechanisms 
if we can kind of keep raising the voice on the mechanisms need to allow that flexibility. I think all of us have been in the field and we recognize that need, but it's more, it's, it's not the sexy stuff of what's in the field, but it's the, you know, when we're writing chapter 3.16 of the ADS, can we get <laughs> some space in there for, you know, here's your funding, now you have 90 days to do some <laughs> consultations and get a local learning agenda and see what the other donors are doing. That might be a little bit more effective than going project by project. Hi, uh, my name is Gilbert Bonsu. And I think, Barbara, you spoke about the processes you put the organizations through when selecting which organization to partner with. Do you feel at a certain stage you lessen these rules? Because I've worked with certain organizations that receive funding from USAID, PETFA, and other organization, and I felt, and they knew they were not ready for, um, to receive such large funding, yet they received it. And Looking at the, when we filled out the grant and looking at everything we had to go through, to me it felt like USAID at one point to make sure they give money to an organization or partner with somebody, kind of uh, lessen the process so that they can work with somebody. Do you think that happens? Yeah, Are let's answer this this, in, in order or this group. Not necessarily, okay. but this group. Yeah, <laughs> okay. that was seems rather pressing. I think uh, oh, that's um, an interesting question. Um, over the last few years, uh, I think as it started with the USA Forward initiative, where there was a push to work more with local organizations, whether it was private sector or civil society organizations or even government institutions. The agency was brainstorming ways um, because often you know, we no, r realize that there isn't as much flexibility with the requirements and there was a move to streamline requirements um, both with um, kind of compliance related issues and streamlining this uh, pre-award survey process. There's actually an additional tool it was called the New Pass, which was a non-US uh, based um, pre-award survey to reduce some of the, or streamline some of the requirements and recognize that if we wanted to partner more with uh, local organizations, we would both need to streamline processes um, and incorporate some of the uh, say findings into the broader capacity building plan in order to you know, um, issue um, more awards with local organizations. So there, were some, there was some work with that, uh, especially as uh, USAID Forward was just starting about let's say about almost five years ago. And there were also some new instruments, oh, I wouldn't say they're necessarily new, but um, kind of revamped from previous years, such as fixed obligation grants um, and implementation letters so that we could um, establish, kind of tie some of these awards to the achievement of certain uh, deliverables, and that would be a way to get par uh, more partnerships with local organizations going. But as for the private sector one, thanks for that question. And I think it's very true that um, when we're having these conversations, uh, sometimes the private sector is not um, included. So uh, thanks for raising that. Uh, when I was in the field, uh, I was in um, Mozambique and Zimbabwe. We were doing some work to identify local uh, private sector providers of uh, capacity building services um, to one, um, also fuel and support local private sector organizations uh, to ensure sustainability and kind of country-led um, responses to capacity building and um, build more demand for that market. So there were um, efforts uh, to map uh, kind of the landscape of capacity building providers, and that varied according, uh, according to country and context. And I know that there was, um, in certain capacity building interventions, there is um, a recognition that if we want to build sustainability, we have to learn from the private sector in terms of revenue generation. Now, I don't think that's something that's systematized and uniform, uh, and it varies according to country context, because some countries have more of a robust kind of network of uh, local capacity building providers. N now, at the Washington level, I'm not quite sure I think that you know there's work that's being done to build community of practice, uh, kind of going to the issue on the community of practice, 
and um, we're working towards, in addition to um, engaging with implementing partners uh, to get more experiences on capacity building, uh, to engage with local, um, or not local, but provi private sector providers. It'd be great to speak afterwards and learn more about what you're doing. Uh, there are efforts through the local solutions group to um, develop more evidence and build kind of a robust um, research agenda on the importance of capacity building for broader development outcomes. And also um, kind of putting together the experiences of different organizations and some of the measurement tools and indices uh, because if we're gonna start looking at things from a uh, you know, the systems perspective, we need to learn, uh, build a stronger community of practice and learn from each other and find ways to build, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to say best practices because it is so varied, but more unified I idea or definition of what is capacity building and some um, stronger tools to tell the story better, in including some of that qualitative types of intervention, so. I'm sitting here agreeing with what everything that Rena just said. I think that there are probably lots of wonderful initiatives going on in isolation around the world, uh, but but it's a bit challenging to, to know how to um, not just share them because I'm, I'm not a big believer in supply side best practices. We've done a great thing, so all of you should do it, but how it fits into what you need to make it a little bit more of a pull rather than a push, and a lot of what you were asking about, about identifying CSO needs, and how to connect them to between the supply and the demand. So it's not just we've got this great product, so we're gonna you know, yeah, enable you to use it, because you're thinking, really? Because either I got trained in it or that's not my big problem, but how do you say no? You don't wanna say no, but you, you want it you know, adjusted to what you need. And I think making that fit is very challenging. And I think all of us, because when you raise your hands if you were providers or receivers of TA, pretty much everybody's a provider. I mean, thinking about how do you do this? So you know you have your, your skill set and expertise. You know what your organization has. You know the results that you need to, to fulfill your requirements. And it needs to be responsive to the actual organizations that are, are providing the health services, or it won't go anywhere. Um, the partnership between the private sector, and especially as we move towards universal health care, you know, in, increasingly important. Um, really nice to hear about the requirements and, and streamlining them because as we work with, with organizations, introducing to them to what it would be like to be actually the main receiver of USAID funds, because right now as CAs, we're the buffer. You know, we get the money and we enable them to do uh, the activities, but they don't need to know the 150 pages of the regulations to be able to do it themselves, which are really daunting. And because it's US taxpayer money, I am totally a believer and if we take your money, we play by your rules. I mean, this is, you know, we're all the taxpayers who fund this, so I don't really have a problem with that. But making it digestible is really the challenge. So, you know, this project I've mentioned in Kenya, and I know I reference Kenya all the time, so that's just <laughs> the, way, the way life is. It was, the uh, intention of the project was to enable local CSOs in the end to receive grant funding from USAID. And so we set up, the whole program was de designed once these organizations had been selected from day one to give them a grant, but to make the compete for the grant so they would know the process, not just as a recipient of it, but to own the process so then they could actually issue their own grants so they could see behind the curtain, you know, and to see all the stuff you have to do to be compliant as well as be able to do your initiatives. And I think that's, that's a capacity building initiative in and of itself. Not just what you do as far as your health services go, but how do you receive donor money? How do you go, how are you accountable for it, and achieve the health outcomes that you want to do? So it's a complicated bag of things you need to know. But if you don't know the whole range of them, it's always going to be with the CAs in the middle. And you know, as I said, I've been in this a long time with the belief that we, we're supposed to be working ourselves out of a job. At least that's <laughs> that's what I've always believed. And how do you do that? You know, because I think we've become our own industry. And I think everybody who works in this field needs, especially on the implementer side, needs to keep that in mind. You know, this is really not for us. This is really for people around the world. I, um, I would add in terms of the um, relaxing of requirements that this there was a lot of work, um, particularly around 
let's say over the last three or four years to work with the um, kind of contracts office to think of alternative ways to streamline the requirements. And I think now we're in uh, more of a, of a learning phase on lessons learned because obviously with this push, um, there have been challenges with local organizations, um, especially as it relates to risk. So we're, we're in the process now of kind of taking a step back and trying to understand um, what worked, what didn't, what were some things that we need to pay more attention to as if we want to continue. Great. I have time for one more question. And Um, I, my question sort of uh, follows Kate's uh, comment. Um, I think that we all have tried to do the capacity building. We all know the ingredients, and we may call it, you know, capacity building one place and performance improvement someplace else and whatever. But I do think that there are, when you're in the field, you have to work with your the other partners, the other projects, the other donors. And those learnings don't seem to go up, even in, to missions in the country. And I think that that is something that we see a little more, say, 10 years ago, it was like, well, obviously you have to coordinate. But there was no incentive in any project to coordinate. Now there's more sort of, do you collaborate? How many you know, times do you meet with the ministry, whatever. I think that we do need to capture those lessons in the field at that level of building our coalitions or our, our um, whatever, collaboratives, uh, to be able to bring those lessons into uh, upstream, but also USAID, and it takes a while to get USAID to recognize then you need to put that incentive into whatever contract or cooperative agreement or whatever, um, because Yes, we follow the rules, but actually, when you're actually trying to get things done, you've got to bend those rules in all kinds of ways to, you know, to do it, but to still comply. <laughs> so I think instead of feeling like you're always bending the rules, maybe that we can have a different kind of incentive to respond to. Yeah, thanks. Can I toss out an idea? Yeah. I've, uh, we all have the same project year. Because, because yes, the notion of all of us who work in capacity building in any one country having the equivalent of an online catalog or a real catalog. These are the things we're offering this year. And the CSOs as recipients can, would have a master plan for their own capacity building and be able to basically shop and say, you know, this year, these are the three things I want to prioritize. You guys can wait until next year, but in my longer term plan, here's what I would like to, to would, is that remotely possible? <laughs> I mean, yeah, because it would be you know, a different way of, of thinking about things, making things much more kind of demand driven, but wouldn't that be cool to be able to, it'd be like an online college catalog or something. Here, here are the different things that, that we could do, and you, this is absolute local ownership. You know, your, your CSO with, you know, in the organization has to have somebody designated as a champion for their capacity building. Figure out their plan and figure out where to, to prioritize so you're not trying to do 17 things at once because everybody shows up and wants you to do something that year, but to be able to organize it a little bit. Is this radical or just crazy? <laughs> <laughs> um, is it at all possible? Yeah, how we, I, I, I don't really have a response. I just, I, I wondered <laughs> if anyone <laughs> else, I, I don't know if this is call and response, if anyone else has had success with strong engagement of multiple partners working with a CSO or a, rec or a rec recipient organization. There's so many implementers in the room, I wonder. Um, I'd really like to leave on a hopeful, positive. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, there are, there are plenty, I think, in our minds, but if, if anyone has that sort of experience of being, of working with a CSO in the field, in a local community, and having that transparency of, my, organi my implementing organization is working on the pimple, but I know that the CSO's toe really hurts. I love that analogy, by the way. It's really good. But I also know that there's another organization working on the toe hurting, and I'm going to make sure that the meds that that person takes for the toe does not create more of an acne outbreak. <laughs> right? So I really love this analogy. And I wonder if anyone 
has worked in the field um, for an implementing organization or for a donor perspective or an M&E perspective that's actually been privy to that conversation. Crickets. <laughs> okay, that actually is telling. Yeah. Maybe take this one, yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I actually was just a guest of a um, two-day networking workshop. Um, and so I was not involved in the, all the previous work leading up to it. But after five years, a common donor along the Thai-Burma uh, border got, gathered the 11 organizations that they had been funding over five years and finally got them together. And for two days, all they got to do was meet and discuss and learn from each other and express their continued needs. Um, and it, it took five years for that to happen. Mm. But that was the success that I saw. Yeah. And did you think good things came out of it after two I think days? a lot of relationships were formed. Mm -hmm. um, and I know in Burma slash Myanmar, um, networking is a term that's thrown around a lot. Um, with a lot of international organizations, there's a lot of requirements for meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and even getting the, the CSO leaders and participants there, um, there was kind of pushback because this is another requirement that they had to mm. be at. Um, but in the end, like the project, um, the project director, whatever her role was, I mean, she was very off to the side, um, silent for this process, just like giving the space and the time for them to learn from each other. Thank you for that. It's encouraging. I think right down. Yeah. Okay, before we close, I'd like to thank our panelists, USAID, GW, and especially our audience, and one of our, um, our panelists who was hidden in the audience, not so hidden in the audience, who is Belkis Georgis, <laughs> <laughs> who is a principal technical advisor for the Leadership Management and Governance Group at MSH. And um, give yourselves a hand for participating. Thank you. Thank you.